So it's time to turn our attention to the sliding leg vise. And again, this is something that is, is seen in sketches of a German cabinet maker's bench. And you can see it in Rubot's work later on, taking his uh, the kind of the stripped bare Rubot version, adding the leg vise, and then the sliding leg vise. And I see being able to use this slider in a lot of instances where I'm planing a long board. Instead of having the dead man here where it just acts as a way to prop it up, I can use this almost like a twin screw vise where I'm able to slide this back and forth and essentially clamp even carcass sides in between these two. And this vise will work just the same as a leg vise. In fact, here's my chop, two inch thick piece of ash that will ride along here and clamp against the front of the bench top. And again, you can see, you know, whatever, whatever distance I need, I'll be able to clamp in between there. And this truly will, uh, I mean, it'll add so much versatility to my clamping that I'm able to maybe not cover with just the uh, leg vise. So it's composed of really two things there. Instead of there being the back half of the vise being the leg, the back half is the slider here that moves back and forth on the V-shaped stretcher that I created a long time ago. And then of course the chop. I have another another wooden screw just like the one on my leg vise. And what I'm going to do is show you how I went about making this back section here because it's designed to run in the grooves. If you look back uh, several Rubo episodes where I inlaid the angle iron into the bench top. That angle iron is really to prevent the bowing of the bench top because essentially there's a tenon up in here. Here's the tenon and as the chop clamps to the front the force is against this tenon against the front of the bench. So the angle iron is there to reinforce the bench and make sure that I'm not bowing it over time. But the issue here is creating the tenon and the V groove on the bottom in such a way that will allow me to slide this up in here and then drop it down on that V groove. You can see there's a gap there that allows for me to lift it up and off the groove on the back. This takes a little bit of finessing to get this fit just right. I don't want it to be too loose so that it's, it's not, there's a little bit of play in here so that I've got ability to lift it up and see, I'm almost might need to refine it even a little bit more to allow me to take it out of there. But I have to kind of lever it in place. So I had to make the, the tenon just the, there we go. I had to make the tenon just the tiniest bit skinnier. In fact, you can see I'm having a little bit of trouble there. I might need to skinny the tenon up a little bit. Skinny it up, is that a word? But anyway, you need to strike that balance between loose and the ability to lift it up and, and rock it out. So, you know, if there's times when I'm not needing the twin screw action, I can just remove the whole assembly and get it out of the way. Um, it slides you know, really nicely along the stretcher here. Um, probably once I apply finish to the bench, I'll put a, you know, an extra coat of paste wax on this rung on the bottom to allow it to slide even more. This back and forth action here, because of the tenon being a little bit looser, really you won't even notice it. Once I've got the chop and the screw on, the weight will be out here and it will lever it forward. The key is, however, when it's pressed up against that groove, I am flush along the front of this vise and the leg, uh, or excuse me, the bench top. That's important, just like it needs the, like the legs are flush to the bench top. Same mechanism. So let's look at how we got this part put together. I laid out the V-notch on the bottom of the sliding leg vise, um, and essentially it's set to be an inch or half an inch deep and 45 degree angles coming in so that there's going to be a quarter inch flat right there at the apex of that V. So, um, wow, it was probably a month ago actually, I went ahead and cut these uh, 45 degree angles with my table saw. Um, I was thinking about doing using a handsaw, but frankly, with such a wide chop and coming in at a low angle, that 45 degree angle, really particularly difficult with a handsaw. Uh, and I figured, what the heck, uh, ran them over on my table saw. So now I need to come in here with a chisel and clean this area out. And I want to establish that 
45 or that quarter inch flat on the bottom. So I've got a just a half inch chisel here. I want to come in and oops, sorry, kick the camera there. I want to come in and knock the majority of this waste out. Actually, if you guys are seeing seeing this waste kind of fly out like that, it's a perfect reason to put on safety glasses, safety goggles, whatever it is you're going to use. Um, just because they're popping off like that. Now you see as I'm chiseling down, the piece is actually shifting. Note this is before I put leather on the jaws of my vise. This is my quarter inch chisel. I'll use that as my last pass. I'll come back with a 3 8 and just remove a little bit more waste. So I'll keep wasting away this stock. Notice I turn the bevel down. This allows me to come in at an angle so I'm not banging the handle against the workpiece. So just take a couple of swipes here on the side just to clean up that bevel. Um, clean up the last little bit with the chisel. And now I'm going to switch over to the router plane just for the final cleanup to get a nice smooth and even depth across the entire groove. Alright, so with that V groove, you see it sits right down there and it slides on that apex on the lower stretcher. Now what I have to do is figure out the fit right here and you can probably see I've gone ahead and marked out where that tenon needs to be, or at least where I think that tenon needs to be. It's probably going to have to be a little bit deeper than this. But what I'm going to do is actually flip the chop around so that it goes in backwards and check it that way. And as I as I look back on this side facing me, um, and I can see that I've got a little bit of clearance. And let's just check the depth. square set to the depth of the groove. Okay, my chop is about my chop is also about at that depth so I'm gonna have to trim uh, you know trim this entire piece a little bit so that I've got room to actually be able to lift the chop up and off the groove. Let's go ahead and work on fitting the tenon because it'll be a heck of a lot easier to remove once the tenon is cut to go ahead and just remove this little section than having to remove you know the whole three inch thick piece. Alright, in my last attempt to fit this, I was kind of running into a section where this tenon was actually it's a perfect fit for the groove, but 
because you set this in by kind of levering it in, um, the tenon itself needs to be a little bit narrower. So I went ahead and uh, took my gauge, uh, my marking gauge, struck a cross grain line over here and hit it with a rabbiting plane and took just the tiniest bit off. You see all these fun, all these fun shavings up here. Just took the tiniest bit off the board there. Hopefully you can see that. And what that does now is give me just a little bit of room to be able to lever it in there. So pretty good there. The problem is now I'm actually bottoming out in that groove, which means my tenon's too long. So I'm going to cut uh, probably an eighth of an inch off the tenon, see where that goes, and uh, try the fit one more time. That's a good point. I'm just going to bring a So I think I've got this finally fitted just right. Um, you know, I removed a little bit from this face to allow me the room to lift it up to clear the bottom groove. Um, I had to trim a little bit off the top of the tenon because the tenon itself was bottoming out in the groove and I wasn't getting clearance uh, on the bottom here. So I trimmed a little bit off there. I was still having some issues getting it to clear the V groove and I didn't want to remove any more of this tenon because it needs to be pretty strong. What I discovered was because I've got this um, little more than three inch thick vice block here, I've got a lot of beef here that has to clear that, that tenon. So I relieved the bottom corner. I uh, just made a couple of chamfers. Uh, this part is actually angled away, angled up like this, and then just chamfered back. It also makes it so that it's not this, you know, it's going to be a lot more durable. Um, so it's not coming to a straight point because as I you know, lever this into place, I, I could possibly be nicking that back corner. Now that it's rounded off, it's just going to be stronger in the long run. But now you can see it fits in there nicely. And again, pull this forward, it's flush. And then to relieve it, just lift it up and that bottom drops right out. So now it's on to actually uh, drilling the holes for the screw and inlaying the nut in the back just like I did with the leg vice leg months ago. So I've got the center here is marked and it's marked so that the screw is going to be the same height as this one which is 10 inches down from the bench top. I've got that marked and just like I would a through mortise I transfer my lines all the way around to the back. Um, that way I've got see my, my crosshairs here, turns them all the way around to the back. So I've got the same crosshairs on the back and there are crosshairs on the nut itself that I can line up and make sure that nut is perfectly centered. Now, unlike when I inlaid the nut on the leg, um, I inlaid the nut first and then drilled the, the hole, which to me, in hindsight, it seems kind of silly because that's a lot of extra wood to remove in the middle, whereas I can just attack it with a Forstner bit remove that one and an eighth inch section in the middle and not have to worry about it later on. It's also going to make it a little bit easier to center the nut on there so that I'm not, you know, the slightest bit out which may cause binding on it. So first things first, put your layout lines in there, transfer them all the way around to give you crosshairs on both sides to play with. And then um, we'll uh, get to work drilling the hole and inlaying the nut and then we'll focus on the parallel guide mortise. So if you've been watching the Rubo series, you'll see this is the same process I used to inlay the nut for the primary leg vise. I use a jig and a pattern router bit and basically ride the bearing against the jig to recess to almost the full depth of the nut. And then referencing off the side walls in the jig using a chisel, I square up the edges. You see this is a really fast and very effective way to get perfectly square and perfectly flush corners so that you get an excellent fit when you try to fit the nut in place. 
mortise is all squared up and you can see I've got a very very close fit. I've intentionally cut the mortise a little bit too short so that when I do get this nut size that I've got a really really piston or strong piston fit in grain to in grain. Um, again, I'm not going to see a whole lot of you know compression this way. It's not like this is a load bearing structure, but because the mortise is so deep, um, I really don't want to compromise the overall strength of this piece by having it you know anything any wiggle room at all. So what I'm going to do is take the tiniest bit off the ends, both ends of the nut, because again I cut this mortise so that it was centered on the hole. Since I've already drilled the hole, I need to make sure that I remove equal amounts of wood from either end. In reality, it's probably, you know, a couple thousands of an inch off either end to get the type of fit I'm looking for. And the way that I, did, that I will size that is I'll cut small chamfers on the back side. In fact, I've already done it. Tiny little chamfers here. I don't know if you can pick that up or not, but those chamfers, have this nut essentially sitting where I want it in the mortise. That, you know, bottom 32nd of an inch is seated in that mortise where I want it to. So what I'm going to do is remove wood from the end grain until that chamfer is gone, or maybe almost gone, and then check the fit from there and slowly work my way to the point where it's in all the way. The thing about this this inlaying this is there is no testing the fit and pulling it back out. The type of fit I'm looking for, once this is seated in this mortise, there's no way to pop this back out, not without breaking the chop and everything. So I'm going for the type of fit, I'll apply glue on it, hammer it home, and it needs to go in all the way. So there's really no second guessing into whether or not this is going to fit or not. Fortunately, I've gone in with a square and I've checked the mortise walls. I'm perfectly square uh, to this face up and down, so I know that if this block is square and flat, it's going to seat all the way in. And that's the fit I'm looking for. So now the point of no return. Put some glue on the long grain faces, hammer it home, and uh, we're good to go. <clears throat> so now I'm going to shape the chop. And I'm not going to do a bevel on the sides, but just on the top and the bottom. So using the frame saw, I laid out the 45-degree uh, angle, cut it off the frame saw, and then going back with the jack plane to plane down to my line. So coming with the chisel, chisel just to relieve the edges so I don't spelch the ends and finish the whole thing up with the jack plane again right down to my layout lines to get a very nice one inch chamfer. So now I'm going to lay out the parallel guide mortise and it's imperative that the chop, the mortise for the guide and the chop and the through mortise and the, the rest of the vise is perfectly aligned so that when you tighten it up you're not going to crack the chop or, or, or crack the parallel guide. Um, so it does need to be dead on a line. So I'll use a saddle square to transfer the lines around to the front and back of the whole assembly. I start the mortise using my mortise chisels just to define the, the edge there. And then I'll go through with a brace and bit and finish the through mortise all the way through to the back side. And so there it is. Sliding vise is, is all completed. Uh, really, you know, kind of skipped over a few parts because it really is exactly the same as the leg vise. Um, I didn't go, you know, to some of the same extents as I did as the, the principal leg vise. For instance, I didn't do a through tenon uh, in the chop on the parallel guide. Uh, the tenon down on the bottom here is just an integral tenon, and it's pegged over on the side with uh, two um, three-eighths inch dowels. You know, 
it's an aesthetic thing that the joint is really, really strong. I got a very, very snug fit on it in the first place. So, you know, it came down to a time savings measure. Did I want to run the, the complete through tenon in there? And I decided not to. So um, I'm using as the peg on my primary leg vise, I'm actually using a, um, a burnisher that is perfectly three eighths of an inch round that fits nicely in there. Um, I don't obviously have a second burnisher lying around for the sliding vise, I did use a piece of 3 8 inch walnut dowel that I had lying around that, that works perfectly. And, you know, probably uh, stainless steel or brass or something like that will be a little bit better because of the, um, the forces that that peg is going to take as you cinch this up. But for now, uh, I'm going to work with it for a little bit. Um, the thing about this sliding vise is it really is an accessory. Most of the work holding is going to be done over on that leg vise. This is gonna be done for specifically wide pieces if I need to dovetail a wide carcass or need to edge plane a long board like this. Um, that's when it'll come into play. Most of the rest of the time, I'm gonna probably take it out and stick it down here on the shelf because you can see obviously it, it sticks out a little bit from the bench. It could possibly get in the way of my work. So it is definitely designed to be removed and to be put in place whenever you want. I may think about just making a traditional dead man that could stay up there all the time. But again, I really don't see myself needing it that much that it's gonna be that big of a deal to reach in and pop it in and out. And you can see, you know, it just kind of pops right in. It's heavy, no question. But it, uh, you know, comes in, comes out, slides along here nicely. Um, what I, I didn't show again was similar to the original build. I uh, put the parallel guide in place and I cut a mortise on the side here for the internal garter and I cut the garter itself. The garter is a slightly different design from what I did before. It's a hunk of cherry I had lying about. It's got a nice finger pull in it that um, allows me to pull it in and out to release the chop from the screw. But the, you know, the screw slides really, really well in here and you can see the perfect use for it would be, you know, slide it way back here and say I needed to, you know, square up the edge of this long piece of quarter saw white oak. I can slip it into the vise there. Slip it into the vise there and I've got full support along the edge of this. I could probably move the bench before I can move the workpiece. So you can imagine if um, you know, you've got a 24 inch wide case side that you need to dovetail onto the bottom or the top, this is the perfect thing to sandwich in between here. Um, and even, even drawer sides are, are longer pieces that you want to be able to drop down below the bench. To be able to grab it on both ends is going to be a lot more stable over the long run. So for example, let's pop this out. Here's a piece of particle board just lying around. Obviously wouldn't be doing the dovetailing of particle board. But I can I can lock it in place pretty firmly on on the leg vise and, and I've got it referenced along the front of the leg, but you know, it doesn't take too much for me to, to pivot it in place because I've got such a little bit in the vise here. So I can slide this over. Lock it down and that's might as well be part of the bench at that point. And you can see I can ride the piece all the way down the front here so that I've only got the tiniest bit exposure to the top that makes it really stable for coming in and doing some work on this edge with a plane or a saw or a chisel or something like that. So you can see, you know, it's, it's a really, really helpful extra pair of hands for using wide stock. Will I use it in everyday use on the bench? Probably not that much, but in the long run, I think it's going to be a great addition. And I think that the German version of this Rubel bench really, uh, had something going on. Now, uh, earlier on in this video, you saw that I had a piece that was shifting about because I, um, I hadn't put leather on the jaws yet. 
No question, the jaws hold really, really well without the leather, but when you add the leather, I mean, the, the, the gripping power is unbelievable. So I put leather on this face and this face of the tail vise, and I went ahead and put leather on the exposed faces of the leg vices. So in the instance of the slider, I have leather on the inside of the chop and I've got a little bit of leather on the inside of the sliding piece here. So I do have two opposing leather faces. Obviously I can't put it on the bench because it slides back and forth. In the instance of leg vise, I did put leather on the inside of the chop and I put a little bit affixed to the front of the bench top as well. I get incredible holding power that way completely change the, the picture of things. So when I glued the leather in place here, I used yellow glue. Um, I didn't have any hide glue at the time, and I figured yellow glue would work. I'd heard that contact cement was definitely a no-no. No problem with yellow glue or hide glue. Hide glue would be nice because it's a little bit more gel-like when it's, when it's dried, it presses a little bit more, plus it's reversible if something goes wrong. So took the, took the gamble and used regular old yellow PVC glue on this one on all of the, the leg vices, I used hide glue. And really it was very, very simple. You know, just kind of paint the glue onto the leather surfaces, position it on the chop itself, and then take a board, um, take a you know, wide board that's gonna be the width of the chop, and stick some wax paper on either side of the board so that the glue doesn't stick to the board itself, and, and really just clamp the board up. And you've got built-in clamping pressure on either side of that. And that's basically what I did for both the leg vise and for the sliding vise. Now the leather's in place, uh, really, the bench is done. Uh, I need to take another pass over the top to flatten it up, and I'm gonna put a Danish oil and paste wax finish on it, and there's nothing else I can do to this bench. Um, it's time to really get to work on it. 